BBC World Service. And on our website, you can explore more of our programs from documentaries to science. Listen and download at any time by going to bbcworldservice.com. On air, online and on smartphones, this is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service with me, Anna Holligan. On a visit to Poland in the strongest terms yet, President Biden had this warning from Moscow. Don't even think about moving on one single inch of NATO territory. We have a sacred obligation under Article 5 to defend each and every inch. NATO territory. We'll hear from Ukraine's port city, Odessa, where there's concern that Russian spies and saboteurs are getting help from the inside. I saw very big light directed on the sky. And you thought that was perhaps a signal to the Russians? Yes, yeah, for sure. And we'll take you to the Afghan capital to hear the voices of young women barred from going back to school. All that and more coming up after the news. BBC News with Sue Montgomery. President Biden says Ukraine's resistance to Russian aggression is part of a great battle for freedom, warning of a long fight ahead. Speaking in the Polish capital, Warsaw, he accused Russia of trying to strangle democracy in Ukraine and of wanting to do so elsewhere as well. He says Vladimir Putin had been bent on violence from the start and he cannot remain in power. From Warsaw, Mark Lowen. It was a, a, a very strident comment at the end of the speech. Uh, he said, for, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Uh, we've just had a statement from a White House official saying the president's point was that Putin cannot be allowed to exercise power over his neighbors or the region. He was not discussing Putin's power in Russia or regime change. I think, of course, the fear will be that and the Kremlin would take from Joe Biden's comment that there will be absolutely no point at all in trying to engage in any kind of dip diplomacy to try to move forward, end this, uh, if, if the Americans are calling for regime change. The western Ukrainian city of Lviv has come under heavy rocket fire. The regional governor said five missile strikes hit a fuel depot and an industrial plant. Here's Anna Foster. This city has been largely quiet over the last few weeks. But in the late afternoon, three loud explosions rang out in the Lviv suburbs and thick black smoke clouded the sky. Several hours later, there were three more. The mayor confirmed five people were injured in the first strike, the target an oil storage facility. This attack in the west came just a day after Russia announced its new focus was the east of the country. It's still pounding cities like Mariupol, where conditions are increasingly desperate. Ukraine says it's pushing back on several fronts across the country, but today's events in Lviv make it harder than ever to determine Russian intent here. The mayor of Chernihiv says the northern city is now completely encircled by Russian forces, and it's impossible to set up safe corridors or even evacuate the wounded. Vladislav Atovchenko said Russian troops had deliberately destroyed the bridge on the vital road to Kiev. The surviving pedestrian bridge is too dangerous because of crossfire. A huge column of buses carrying 4,000 residents of the besieged Ukrainian city of Mariupol is on the move again after it was blocked by Russian troops for 48 hours. Mariupol's deputy mayor, Sergei Orlov, said the situation was desperate. Some is dying of dehydration or lack of food. Some is dying of lack of medicine, it's insulin and something like this because people cannot find medical help. You should understand that about 70% of hospitals is destroyed by bombing and shelling. World News from the BBC. The Kharkiv Music Festival in Ukraine's second city has gone ahead, despite relentless shelling by Russia since the start of the war. Organizers have called it a concert amongst explosions. In other news, the European Union foreign policy chief, Josette Borrell, says a deal to revive the 2015 nuclear agreement with Iran is within reach, following nearly a year of talks in Vienna. This report from Simon Ponsford. 
The deal is designed to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions in return for lifting sanctions. This month, negotiators have strongly hinted that an agreement is all but finalized. The EU's foreign policy chief has now echoed that optimism. But negotiators also caution that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And there are still plenty of problems that could scupper a revival of the deal, which Donald Trump abandoned in 2018. Among them is Iran's demand for the dropping of sanctions against its revolutionary guards. Analysts warn that Iran has increased the pace of its nuclear program and that failure to stop it would raise the risk of regional conflict. The people of Zimbabwe have voted in a series of elections seen as a test of strength for the newly formed opposition party, the Citizens' Coalition for Change, which is led by Nelson Chamesa. Results will start to be announced on Sunday. Shingai Nyoka reports from Harare. The voter turnout was relatively low, in stark contrast to the large numbers that attended the campaign rallies. And although voting was largely peaceful and smooth, some voters say they were turned away as their names did not appear on the voting roll. Others went to the wrong polling station. The opposition party, the Citizens' Coalition for Change, which is expected to win most of the seats, accused the state electoral commission of removing voters from the roll or changing their polling stations without notice. These elections are seen as a test run for general polls next year. CBC News. Thank you for joining us on News Hour from the BBC World Service. We're coming to you live from London. I'm Anna Holligan. Following an historic visit in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Biden is leaving Poland with a promise to protect NATO allies. During a meeting with Ukrainian refugees, he described Vladimir Putin as a butcher. Later, addressing crowds outside the Polish palace, he implied he wished for regime change in Russia. Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia, for free people refuse to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principles, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibility. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Uh, the White House has since sent out a clarification saying that President Biden was not, in fact, calling for regime change, but that his point was that the Russian leader cannot be allowed to exercise power over his neighbours or the region. But President Biden did have a direct warning for Vladimir Putin. Don't even think about moving on one single inch of NATO territory. We have sacred obligations. We have a sacred obligation under Article 5 to defend each and every inch of NATO territory for the full force of our collective power. Lukasz Yashina is the spokesman for Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Was he impressed? The speech was great anyway, because the fact he gave such important message address now here in Warsaw, close to the Ukrainian border, in the capital of Poland, in the city destroyed completely, which is very similar to the present look of Mariupol, Kharkiv, or Kiev, was a very important fact and very important gesture that president of the most powerful country in the world is coming to Warsaw and he speaks very plainly about the Russian aggression, about Mr. Putin's decision about the situation in Ukraine. He underlined the uh, role of East and Central Europe in the history of the world, among them Poland and Ukraine. Secondly, he declared openly who is responsible for that war and that this responsible person is Mr. Putin. And he also said to Russians that there's always a time to change the dictator. It was a very moving and deep experience. He says he's got to go. What did you make of that? That's probably the most, the, the only possible solution to stop that war, to change the situation, to give Russia possibility to be again a part of civilized world. Putin cannot be ba accepted back uh, into our world society. He cannot be hurt. He's not a partner. We trust him. Only without him, this war could be stopped. Aggression for Russia into Ukraine could be stopped, and Russia could be again a valuable partner for all of us, but among them Poland, Ukraine, United States, Western Europe. 
And the White House has since clarified he wasn't actually calling for a regime change. He was talking about President Putin not being allowed to, to exercise power in, in neighboring countries. But do you, do you feel as though that's helpful or do you fear it could inflame the situation? Uh, we've got in Polish uh, a very important uh, sentence that Wojbatka Wróżyła. There are two equal possibilities. The Russians uh, are very tough with prestige, with uh, influencing on them. And they, of course, don't want someone to tell them what to do. But I think Russian people, Russian see where Vladimir Putin heads them into the world with Western world. And Russia never won such war. He leads them into the economical crisis. But, of course, we know that not only Putin himself is responsible for the situation, also regime, he leads. But sometimes we need a compromise. Someone should be responsible for taking off Mr. Putin and uh, let's say always such cap d'etats are made by people from the regime. Do you get the sense that, that senior European leaders have started to contemplate the possibility that Ukraine might actually win this? If I can be honest, if I can be honest with you, they did not. They start to contemplate, they start to think about this, but it not leads into any serious decision so far. Lukasz Szczyna, spokesman from Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Ukrainian forces are reported to have gone on the offensive in several places, retaking a number of towns and villages from the Russians. And earlier today, I spoke to Russian political analyst and former presidential spokesman Sergei Markov. He actually conceded that things hadn't exactly gone Russia's way. The resistance of Ukrainian army had been a surprise uh, for the uh, Kremlin because it uh, expected that uh, because of uh, during this operation in Crimea, 87% of Ukrainian army took Russian side. Uh, we expected that also a uh, sufficient part of Ukrainian army will not uh, uh, fight against uh, Russian army, but will uh, be ready to take a Russian side. It didn't happen. So is that partly why it went so wrong for the Russians? Philip O'Brien is Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of St. Andrews. Because they were overrated and the Ukrainians were underrated. They simply were not as good of a military as people thought, and the Ukrainians were much better prepared than people thought. And we keep on hearing about the stalled advances, the lack of fuel, rations, and, and that kind of thing. But is this more than just a logistical failure? Because on paper, it should have been much easier for Russia to achieve its ambitions. What people thought on paper was just false. So that, that should be dropped aside. The logistics played a huge role, but it's not everything at all. I mean, they've had trouble, it seems, bringing up supplies from almost the moment the campaign started, and they underestimated, but they really did think they were going to have a short campaign. There were a number of significant failures up and down the line. One of the most, I think, important to point to is the inability to gain control of the air very early on. You were, everyone thought it was this huge modern air force that the Russians should be able to dominate the air, and they've not been able to do that. And that means that in many ways they can't run complex systems. And on the other hand, on the, on the bottom scale, they hadn't prepared their soldiers. The, the soldiers, in many cases, were lied to in the sense that some were told, seemed to be told it was a training exercise. Others that were knew they were going into Ukraine were told they were going to be welcomed as liberators. So many of the soldiers simply seemed to be completely unprepared for what they were going to find. So the morale does not seem to be what one would expect from a professional army doing a professional campaign. And on the flip side, on the Ukrainian side, massively yeah. underrated. This is simply a problem with the strategic studies community that, that almost all the narrative written about this campaign at any time was written by Russian military experts. And Russian military experts knew the Russian military, maybe not as well as they thought they knew it, but at least they knew something about the Russian military. They seem to know or care very little about the Ukrainian military. But you know, what we see is Ukraine has been preparing for this war and preparing for it well since at least 2014. And the Ukrainians put that time to good use. And Ukraine appears to have made some military gains now around Irpin, yep. uh, down in the south. Yep. I mean, from, from, from your perspective, is there any chance the way things are going, Ukraine could actually win this? I mean, it's going to be very hard to drive all the Russian troops out of Ukraine. 
particularly once you get closer to the Russian border, where the Russian troops will have much less of a logistical problem. So, you know, could the Russians, with the army they have now, they will be limited to eastern Ukraine, I think. You know, they're falling back on that. What Ukraine will be faced with is do they try to drive Russia out of all of Ukraine. So it will become a trickier one if the Russians actually do retreat into eastern Ukraine and then try and set up sort of a, a large buffer state. Then Ukraine will be faced with a bit of a dilemma about what to do with it. However, time's also in some ways on Ukraine's side because if Russia does that, then they live under basically permanent sanctions. If you were wargaming, where would you predict it goes from here? Well, the problem is too many people were wargaming, and they looked at it like a war game. Mm -hmm. And it's not a war game, because you have to actually war game in a way to have a political outcome. This is the great problem Russia has. It actually thought it could dictate a political outcome. It would take over Ukraine and dictate to, to NATO that, okay, but this is over, we run the UK and deal with it. If, however, they end up trying to take part of Ukraine, and the rest of Ukraine is still fighting, which is what the Eastern strategy is, well, then they live under these sanctions. They can't dictate an outcome. They end up in a permanent war. So it's one of those, in the war game, is there a rationality in a military way to doing what they're doing? Yes, there is. Is it rational political? I think much less so. Insights from Philip O'Brien there. Now, while President Biden was speaking in Poland, explosions were heard near the western Ukrainian city of Lviv, and dark clouds of smoke were seen billowing into the sky. The regional governor said five missile strikes hit a fuel depot and an industrial plant. The BBC's Anna Foster is there. And, Anna, these explosions were on the outskirts. Do we know why these buildings were targeted? Well, they've been releasing very small amounts of, of information. As you said there, quite rightly, the first one, um, which happened at about 4 o'clock our time this afternoon, um, was an oil storage facility. And on social media, there were videos of the big white circular containers on fire, this billowing smoke, big, big flames shooting up into the air. Um, and because of that oil, I mean, that, that smoke was on the horizon. And we're talking about the, 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 the suburbs of Lviv as well. I mean, from our location, probably only two or three kilometers, we could see the, the smoke rising into the air for, for quite a long time. And then a few hours later, uh, in fact, just as I was... Um, about to do a, a report on uh, on BBC World TV, we heard three more um, missiles land. You know what sounded really quite close to our position. I saw the flash from one of them. Um, again, we were told that that was some kind of repairing facility. The Ukrainians they they don't want to give away too much information. I think it would be naive to suggest that the Russians didn't know exactly what they were trying to target. Um, but the Ukrainians are certainly trying to to protect as much information as they can. But it, it's really unusual to see this in Lviv. This is not one of the, the cities in Ukraine that has been hard hit so far. It's, it's far in the west. Russia said yesterday it was going to focus on the east of the country. Mm. Um, so people here who have been I don't want to say relaxed, because obviously this is a country at war, but comparatively so, people who had been you know, going about their lives reasonably normally um, are feeling tense and really not knowing what to expect next year tonight. I heard you say earlier when there were sirens going off, people barely flinched and continued drinking their coffee. But as you say, it's unusual because Russia has said they were focusing on the east, Lviv is in the west. So what does this actually suggest? Well, it is very simplest. It, it suggests that, that what Russia say and what Russia do are two entirely different things. You know, as you rightly point out, this makes no sense at all in the context of that announcement yesterday that the first phase of the operation was over and that they were going to focus instead on the Donbass region in the east. Um, I mean, certainly looking at the, the, the pictures of this oil storage depot that's been targeted, um, it, it's sizable, but it, it doesn't look like it's, it's going to be one of the larger ones in, in Ukraine. So was this to send a, a message? Was this something to do with the fact that President Biden was in Poland today? And this is the, the, the closest, because they question. Thank you, Anna. No. Anna Foster in Lviv there. You're listening to BBC World Service. This is News at R. Coming up, Afghan students and teachers urge Taliban to reopen girls' schools.
The international community, human rights organizations, listen to us. Shame on you all that in the 21st century you're all thinking of progress and new inventions. Here is an entire generation not allowed to go to school. The headlines this hour, President Biden has told an audience in Poland that Vladimir Putin was bent on violence in Ukraine from the start, having earlier described the Russian leader as a butcher. Several missiles have struck the western Ukrainian city of Lviv with targets including a fuel storage depot. In Chernihiv, in the north, the mayor says the city is encircled by Russian forces and there is no way to evacuate the badly wounded people. This is Anna Holligan. You're listening to News Hour Live from the BBC in London. And while the focus in Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been on the front line fighting with heavy artillery and airstrikes, Ukrainians are also worrying about another threat. There's been talk of Russian spies and saboteurs weakening the country from the inside. A month into the war, with fear and suspicion swirling, Andrew Harding reports from the southern city of Odessa. another air raid siren just before curfew. And in thousands of homes here in Odessa, the dread, not just of Russian bombs, but of Russian spies, Russian saboteurs, maybe even next door. A few nights ago, the police came to Bogdan Milko's small apartment. His neighbors had reported suspicious activity, a flashing red light visible through the window, maybe a signal to Russian aircraft. It was my neighbors, he says, showing me a set of fairy lights. They're scared about security, but this is paranoia. I had to go to the police station and explain that I'm just a normal guy. I'm not trying to help the Russians. As we leave his apartment, a crowd suddenly gathers around us in the dark blocking us, demanding to see our documents. We have children, we don't want a bomb dropping here, says one woman. Well, that was a very telling moment. I think people here are really suspicious of strangers, people looking out everywhere, concerned that there might be Russian agents or Russian sympathizers causing trouble. Hands behind your back. An Ukrainian policeman shouts in TV footage showing the arrest of suspected Russian saboteurs. There have been several such cases around the country. But is there a danger of vigilance turning into paranoia? Maybe that's what the Russians want. This is not paranoia, says Odessa's police captain Volodymyr Kalina. There are Russian agents and citizens of Ukraine working against us. That's a fact. They're trying to distract us, to make us pay attention to the wrong places. But is that working? After a month of war, Ukrainians seem more united than ever. Security analyst Hannah Schellest believes most Russian undercover operatives here are probably still lying low for now. But she's in no doubt about what they're here for. It is the storage of the ammunition and weapons in the town, uh, spreading disinformation and gossip. Then it is the marking in the city at the different buildings, the signs where to go. And the fourth, it is the marking of the certain uh, signaling, electronic or visual, for the artillery and for the airstrike. So targets. Exactly. Targets or directions. Off the windy coastline of Odessa, recent video footage shows shells fired by the Russian Navy hitting the waves. Patrolling the nearby shore, locals like Dmitry Novak, a retired businessman, believe the Russians are getting directions from inside the city. I saw very big light directed on the sky. 
It, it, it was on the roof of this building. A big light shining out the sea. Shining, screen. yes. And yeah. you thought that would perhaps be a signal to the Russians? Yes, for sure. Because soon it was switched off by military by people. We called them and uh, they came and immediately this light was switched off. I think it was signal for the Russians. That's mm. why we are walking, uh, walking carefully to find any other signals. Maybe they are leaving any other thing, signals in order to direct them. So everyone's already on alert. Yes, yes, everybody. Every two hours we are changing shifts. And so Ukraine remains vigilant, aware that war isn't only fought on the front lines. Andrew Harding reporting from the southern port city of Odessa there. President Biden met some of the 2.2 million Ukrainians who sought refuge across the border in Poland. While the numbers have actually started to fall over the past few days, the Polish border guard said today they were down 6.4% this Friday compared to last, although, of course, they are still vast. Our candidate, Tommy Siak, is from the Christian Brother Albert Foundation, which is working with refugees from Ukraine. What has he been witnessing? As a country, we are not ready for so many refugees. We are trying very hard. It's amazing what we have been achieving. But, you know, today's refugees are very different from the first one. These people who have lost everything, uh, they haven't seen the death of their loved ones. Uh, they need different support, psychological help. We have one kid. I think he is like 10 years old, yes. And he saw that his mother and father died. Now when he hear the car outside of the building, he's hiding. This is a big trauma. And uh, three kids yeah, from the States is in the hospital. Because, you know, when you travel from far away, uh, they don't eat properly. They sleep everywhere. And now they have a, a lot of disease problem with the stomach and uh, uh, with the fever and something like this. You mentioned the children who are who are scarred. They've seen their parents yes. killed. Are there a lot of children who are coming to you alone? Uh, no, that kid is with the grandmother, but this grandmother, the same, she, she has a lot of problems with her. She's thinking she will die very quickly and uh, she's not good good shape. Uh, we have a family who saw that Russian soldiers, they killed 50 people in the town. They saw this, you know, on his eyes. That was from Harkov, from Kiev, from Brody. So the story is so different, you know, from the beginning when we were on the border, we saw it was very cold, uh, small kids, uh, a lot of people. That was okay, we should be help these people because this is normal. But that was such a different situation. These people have a lot, you know, they have family in Poland or uh, on Europe. they traveling, they have some money and they, they leave the houses. But the house is still there in Ukraine. But now in Poland, a lot of people who don't have house, they don't have nothing. They destroy everything. And they say that maybe we're we'll back in, in Ukraine when uh, war will be uh, over. But they don't have place in Ukraine to stay, to rebuild this house. It's crazy. It's such a different situation now. And nobody talking about the different situation because everybody showing these pictures from the beginning and I understand it but I think now both people and Europe should be helping much more because now it's a, a much harder situation with the refugees and the people need the help even more I don't think about you know food about uh, about medicine I'm saying about uh, they need uh, physical and uh, mental help. They're, they're traumatized, they're physically and, and, and mentally scarred by yeah. their experiences. It's not enough to give these people uh, food, medicine. You need something more because they need to help every, every single day. Uh, so on the moment, we have a new employer in our foundation, a girl from Ukraine, and she's uh, psychologic. She psychologic. She was this woman she helping in this channel in our center for the women and kids she was helping almost every day if not if she's not there she helping on the phone can you handle it do you have the capacity and the resources and and the help and the finances to be able to manage these types of people that you're dealing with we're trying but if this war does not uh, end soon if we don't uh, don't do together for 
Putin to end uh, the war will face a huge humanitarian crisis. Arkadius Tomasiak. You're listening to the BBC World Service. Join Gabriel Gatehouse for a story of conspiracy, anarchy and plots to break reality. This is a journey.